from the Shitter in downtown Newton Hall, and we are here with Mike Moffat of Shit Audio. Today, Mike is going to talk all things multi-bit and turntable soul. Mike, how are you today? I'm doing just fine. I thought we would kick it off with a very basic question, and that is, what is multi-bit for the uninformed uh, in terms of digital conversion in high-end audio? Okay, multi-bit, it refers to digital to analog converters and not the entire box, mm -hmm. but the portion of that box that takes numbers, because digital audio is a series of numbers, uh, and converts them to analog. And they're generally in the form of ICs, some uh, discrete, DACs have been built in the early days, but those are really obsolete. Hmm. Uh, and multi-bit is, as I said, the way it all started. The, uh, uh, the way digital audio works is it's uh, like the music in the record side is going on and there's a strobe and it takes a picture mm. and another strobe and it does 44,100 strobes per second. Um, so what you've got are a series of dots that uh, strobe, 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 strobe that are uh, uh, converted to numbers. And then those numbers are stored on a uh, CD or streamed or um, on a computer in a file, however they are, but they're just nothing but a series of numbers. Um, now, what happened about, let's see, 83 to 90, seven, eight years on the way in, um, the... Uh, this new type of D to A converter chip appeared, which was called Delta Sigma or DS. And what that is, is a much faster converting um, uh, chip with fewer bits. So you're really, um, in a sense, it's mathematically valid and it's uh, graduate level uh, math but the Delta Sigma chips basically run faster with fewer bits. And uh, uh, one can make mathematical arguments that you don't lose anything. Um, and uh, that is the common way of doing things today um, because the Delta Sigma chips are cheaper. Hmm. So, um, but it is possible to make Delta Sigma um, equipped uh, DACs that do sound better. And that's one of uh, Shit's missions, or one of my missions certainly, uh, on the digital side is to make it so that uh, we can sell a D-Day converter for 100 uh, bucks, uh, which we do with the Delta Sigma chip, and make it good enough so that people who wonder, gee, is there something better, will realize you can do it, and then they um, become members of the fold, so to speak. They realize, uh, hey, it does sound better. It's not a lot of money, and uh, it interests them in a new hobby. Um, when you look at a traditional type of Delta Sigma, da Delta Sigma DAC, what parts or what design elements really trigger such poor quality or have historically where you guys are kind of fixing them? What's the, what, what's the thing that made them sound so terrible in the beginning? Well, as you go down to DAX being desirable in smaller and smaller platforms and in areas where you don't expect a lot of quality, for example, phones, mm -hmm. okay, the quality becomes less important mm. to deliver. And uh, what becomes important is, well, gee, how can I add a deck in here and uh, not spend a lot of money mm. and add features? 
And there's a tendency for people to be more focused on features today than they were 40 years ago when they were more focused on quality. And uh, when you look at the features that you get today for how much money you have to spend to get it, it's really a far better economical deal from a standpoint of features than it was back then. Um, but the quality has has suffered. Mm. Um, and uh, there are fewer people that really care about quality than they could, than care about features. And what you've got surrounding this quality desire is a small industry of uh, what I'll call high-enders, high-end audios companies that attempt to, or that do build better sounding products. And uh, there's a demand for it because we have shows, well, we used to have shows every year, perhaps we will again sometime that attract thousands and thousands of people. So there are people out there that really do care about quality and it's like, that's what my mission is to build better digital quality. But just going back a bit, uh, my point about uh, digital audio where it's a series of strobe, 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 strobe. Mm -hmm. There's holes in the music, mm -hmm. okay, um, that are filtered, um, which again, theoretically, um, it's like if you go to a, if you go to a movie, there's the, the, uh, the movie flickers, it's a series of, of steady, um, images that flicker and there's a certain rate once you get to it that your eye can't tell mm -hmm. where it's not motion and it's unless there, yeah it's 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 it looks smooth and the same thing is with digital audio at 44 one um you don't hear the holes in the music mm. anymore and it's it's a uh, and it it theoretically will go up to 20,000 hertz plus and will sound a little better. God, this is really geeky talk. <laughs> um, I, but, haven't even, uh, I have an even geekier question for you then, Mike. Uh, someone asked, the term multi-bit and R2R are also often interchangeable. Is there a difference between those two definitions and what is it? Well, R2R refers to the... Uh, the resistor network that's in uh, many multi-bit decks. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't have to be R2R, but that's one of the uh, the the most common way of doing it. And uh, um, so that's how R2R relates to multi-bit decks. The uh, point I was going to head for, mm -hmm. although I'm not going to quite yak about it just yet, is... The uh, multi-bit has some holes in between it, but there's a kind of audio where there are no holes. It's continuous over time, and that's analog. Mm. And that's why you have uh, all of these uh, analog druids out there, and I'm one of them. You know, I, I don't, uh, hey, I'll worship trees and tell people that I really like to do it, uh, but I really believe in... Uh, in analog, I mean, it does, it has a certain kind of unique sound, but it's a pain in the ass. Mm. Oh, it's a pain in the ass. It's more money. Um, it's something you have to futz with on a turntable and you got to buy records or pre-recorded records are the, the common analog format, but more on that later, just to finish. Well, you go from analog to Multi-bit, which has a hole, has 44,100 holes a mm. second, or 48,000, depending on the sampling rate. Or even, uh, you know, there's uh, multiples of that that run 96K, um, 192K. Um, and uh, then you've got the uh, Delta Sigma that uh, throw away bits and try to manipulate the sound with uh, with uh, 
uh, higher speeds and reduced bit, bit widths. And uh, I'll throw this out there. Uh, one of the reasons that I don't like, or no, that's, that's harsh, why I prefer multi-bit, and I really do because it sounds more musical to me. It sounds more like sitting in a concert hall. Um, the, uh, the, the Delta Sigma, um, we are now just beginning to look at to try to build an, a better implementation of it. Hmm. And uh, we've got uh, Ivana working on the math right now. And uh, then we'll have uh, Dave doing the circuit boards and that sort of thing. And we're going to try to build the best possible Delta Sigma converter. The problem is um, we've never built one, so it's going to go slowly. <laughs> Um, but I've spent my whole life and my whole career building things I didn't know how to build. Mm. And eventually uh, they get to be okay sounding, you know, <laughs> and that's what we're about. Oh, and measurements. You know, there's been a lot of emphasis lately about measurements. And uh, yeah, some degree of measurements are uh, um, helpful. Um, but the type of measurements that one sees today, um, let's see, let me try to think of a good analogy. It would be cars, I guess. Do you care whether your car can really go six or 700 miles an hour because it goes mm -hmm. beyond the capability of our roads. If you drive a car at 600 miles on the road, it's gonna take off like an airplane, it's gonna be all over the place, you hit a bump. Um, and these 140 or 50 dB plots are just, it's like all of these uh, audio engineering types uh, sitting around discussing them, is that they're all giving each other hand jobs. <laughs> It's uh, just absolutely useless in terms of what people can really hear. Mm. And, uh, uh, and that's not to say that some degree of measurements aren't important. Um, analog ones, digital ones, they are. Um, but it's uh, just, it gets down to the point where it's irrelevant. Um, so that's a viewpoint and people lose track of the primary purpose of an audio system, which is to reproduce music as it sounded and the specs, there have been some things with really wonderful specs that sounded like ass. And there have been some things with so-so specs that have sounded better. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's uh, my way of thinking. Does that hold, I, I hear that argument quite a bit when it comes to amplifiers. Uh, and they're like, oh, well, I've, I have a really good measuring amplifier, but it, it can sound terrible. Do you think that to a lesser degree is, or more with the, translated to digital as well when you measure something on, on a digital uh translation like a digital DAC product do you feel that like it's more easy to predict the outcome for measurements or less easy to predict the outcome than it would be for an amplifier or a speak speaker even well this is just my own opinion but my opinion is that if you have an amplifier that measures wonderfully but sounds uh terrible then um we haven't figured out all the measurements, measurements. yet that that are important. Mm -hmm. um, and th there's some measurements that apply more to digital than analog and vice versa. And then other measurements that uh, apply to, uh, say, uh, turntables that are different, that are more mechanical, mm -hmm. uh, mechanically oriented. 
And it's just, it's, uh, you know, what do I know? I've, I've been doing this all my life and the, uh, the more I do it, the more I realize, uh, got a lot to learn here. Um, and, uh, like I say, some, I suppose if I cared more about measurements, I would try to figure out better ones, but, uh, I use my ears anyway. Um, and traditional ones as well. Huh. And, uh, I'd rather build something that, uh, that, you know, gives me chills mm -hmm. than something that, uh, you know, it looks good on a two-dimensional paper. You know, real music is uh, definitely 3D, you know. Uh, just going back to the multi bit, is, it, is there any reason why it's better for hi-fi, do you think? Or is it, what we already talked about, it fills in the gaps a little bit more? It fills in the gaps a little more. It's not reduced bit width. It doesn't depend upon uh, mathematical constructs. Hmm. And, uh, it's, you know, again, it's a matter of opinion. There are people that, uh, that like whatever music they listen to might not be, the differences might not be as apparent. Okay. As other forms of music or which have meaning to them. Again, it's all in the, uh, eyes of the beholder mm -hmm. um, or the ears of the beholder and uh, um, I uh, I like multi-bit and that's me and particularly for complex music um, I think multi-bit is much better switching gears just a little bit what would you say is the role of digital filters in the DAC process how much influence do they have over the overall sound Whenever you have an oversampling converter or an upsampling converter, I think is what the current term is, you have to have a digital filter that's inherent in the uh, digital portion of the change. There's uh, several different types of optimizations. Um, and uh, there's some that uh, optimize the frequency domain. There's some that optimize, that make it flat, okay? And then there's some that optimize the time domain that make it image. Um, unfortunately, uh, generally, the time domain filters do terrible in the frequency domain and vice versa, so. Hmm. But we call, we have a mega combo burrito filter, and that's Jason's fault. He named it, um, and uh, uh, it's both. It has both. It's a longer running filter, and uh, uh, it it does both, and it has a certain kind of sound. I mean, it has a very 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 flat frequency response, and it has a, an uncanny ability to image, mm. which generally since most digital devices are frequency domain optimized they generally don't image as well which is harder to hear in headphones hmm. it's a different kind of very interesting sound but in speakers it's uh, more apparent where you get you're listening to something and if you have accurate um, time domain phase speakers you can actually hear things behind you from two speakers in front of you, um, two stereo speakers in front of you. So, um, yeah, yeah, super so. interesting the way our brains are wired to detect things based upon how they sound, like in a geographic space. Because uh, I, I did an interview once with a person who said that our, our ears are like geared to hear things above us. Like if something, it, you know it, you know just by the way something sounds, if it's here or if it's above your ear, inherently in your, the way your brain works. Yeah, if you hear something, you're, you want to know whether it's something that, you know, anthropologically you want to know whether it's something that's going to eat you. Yeah. Which is frequency domain, you recognize what it is, and then you want to get away from it, which is time domain, <laughs> which is where it is. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, like I say, ours is the only folder I know of that have both. Mm -hmm. Or that has both. So well, we've been talking about digital quite a bit. Uh, you also produced a turntable called The Soul. And I just kind of wanted to know how did your approach change designing an analog device such as the Soul compared to when your, your approach for doing a DAC? Well, the Soul was just like the first DAC I did back in the 1980s. Um, I had no idea how to do it, so I built a DAC. Mm -hmm. And it was after uh, a series of... Uh, upstarts, bad ideas, and so on and so forth that it finally started to, it just started to get really good. Um, I've Okay, I come from an older era of audiophiles, which turntables, it was almost unheard of unless you were buying just a cheap little record player to buy something that was uh, plug and play, ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, turntables were a project you would buy a turntable you would buy an arm for the turntable you would buy a cartridge for the turntable um and you might buy accessories like d stat uh, things that would uh, zero stats was a little um gun looking thing that got rid of the static electricity from your records so that all the dust would uh, leap on them. There were a series of, of, uh, of uh, things to get uh, that were available. Now, the um, turntable itself was a project. You had to get the arm on it. You had to get the arm mounted in exactly the right spot. Um, in an arm, you want the cartridge to be exactly parallel to the surface of the record um, for it to sound the best. Um, you want a certain amount of stylish pressure, or mm -hmm. as the English call it, playing weight. Mm. Um, you've got parameters anti-skating, which are less important, but still make a difference. Um, that uh, uh, make it so your turn so your cartridge doesn't want to go towards the center of the record. Um, you've got all these adjustments, and now what everybody wants is to go and buy a turntable and have it work. And if you're going to go buy a turntable, just have it work. The designer of the turntable has to make assumptions about. Mm -hmm which cartridge is, the geometry, this, that, where's it pointed, is the arm parallel to the surface of the record, what's the playing way, and on and on and on. And in the old days, if you were going to have the highest performance um, turntable system, you it required an investment on the part of the user had to study a little bit figure out what he was doing and uh uh he would then do what he could within the uh all of the mounting parameters of the cartridge whereas today um if you buy a pre-set up turntable uh, one that doesn't require any um adjustment um, then all those assumptions have been made for you. And you have, in many instances, no way to, uh, in most of the instances, no way to adjust anything or very little. And uh, what the soul is, since it requires some effort um, to realize that, well, to make our public realize that they're going to get out of a turntable what they put into it. You know, it's kind of like a marriage. Mm. You know, it's uh, the more you do, the better it is. Mm. And uh, it's, it's a lot of work. But what we do with the soul is we supply a cartridge and a pre-set up arm so that... Um, the user who just wants to use that cartridge, um, it's all pre-set up. 
Okay. And uh, the, the advantage is that that gives you your simplicity advantage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it still makes it so that if you want to try a really good cartridge um, and you want to go down that rabbit hole, um, you can use the, the sole is good enough for almost any cartridge I could think of, you know, and I'm a big DECA fan and mm. it's kind of an oddball cartridge out of England. They're very expensive, but, uh, damn, they sound good and it's good from any level of cartridge you can use, you know, from the highest end on down to the, uh, far less expensive ones. And that can't be said out of, uh, all the, uh, entry-level turntables and for what the sole costs it's just at the high end of the entry-level turntables in addition it's got all these additions to tweak anything and um and if you want to take the time and it's all on youtube to um, learn how to do all this stuff then you can do it and you can really optimize your turntable so you can have it both ways you can have it as a pre-setup or you can uh um uh, have it uh, so that you uh, tweak every little ultimate detail out of it, um, which is how it was in the old days. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's a have it your way. The uh, the soul is uh, um, quite the sounder if you want to spend some time and uh, and adjust it up, and it's a perfectly um, Perfectly good, uh, uh, perfectly amazing turntable. It's uh, pretty good. I mean, you can do better, but you're thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and maybe even tens of thousands of dollars because that's what the elaborate turntables cost. And yeah, anyway, I'd rather have a car. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and one question that I recall being asked, is it gonna work in 50 hertz? And the answer is, uh, yeah, it's gonna work on 50 hertz, but the speed will be off. So what we need to do is to supply a different pulley for 50 hertz, um, which we haven't done yet because it was really sort of a, uh, well, what's gonna happen if we build a turntable type uh, venture? And now that it's taken off, uh, we just may have to do that for people that have 50 hertz power. Is there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else, Mike, you want to add? That's the, list, the end of the questions I have for you. No, I'm just, um, you know, I'm just sitting here babbling anyway. <laughs> uh, but I enjoy babbling about audio because I love audio. You know, I mean, I love going to concerts. I love going to classical music concerts, operas, Grateful Dead concerts. Um, I've been to a lot of them. Um, rock concerts. Um, yeah, I've been to quite a bit of things and I just enjoy this. And I'm doing this because I love it. And I'm doing this because it's fun and I'm doing this because it's a pretty cool hobby and I do it because it's a, uh, it can get me a little bit emotionally excited mm. according to the music and emotional excitement's hard to come by, you know? So that's what I got. Yeah, Mike, let's, uh, I got one comment I'd like to mention. Can mm -hmm. we see your shirt? Can you? Oh, yeah. Somebody... Shit happens. Yeah, thank you. We, we are getting it. We've, <laughs> I, Mike answered this on the last one yeah. as well, but we're just as a refresher, there's a couple of people asking about any updates with the gadget. I know you The gadget. About. God, I want to sell that thing, but we need a, uh, you know, our, uh, our shit digital brain trust is uh, Dave, me, and Ivana, and we only have time for so much. We're going to do it. It's just that we're going to have to get a whole new processor running that's fast enough because the gadget is really processor intensive. 
Um, but we are going to do it because I really believe in the thing. It's just we can't get it fitted into a DSP processor and make it work really well over 48 kilohertz. And what if somebody runs a 98 or 96K hmm. recording at it or a 192? It's just not going to have the gas. So uh, we want to get that done that way, but we, we're going to have to go with a... Uh, much, much, much faster processor. And uh, right well, now, my priority is uh, the uh, the Sigma Delta experiment. And uh, a couple of the things that, uh, um, that I'd have to shoot everybody if I told them. <laughs> we don't want to go there. So we'll one pass, is, we'll pass on that one. Pass on that one. Someone is asking if you saw the wall of sound at any of your dead concerts. Oh, yeah. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. That was John Curl. John Curl did that. Mm. And the original Levinson preamp was the JC2, the John Curl 2. And that's why uh, the original Levinson stuff didn't sound that good because John Curl was really more... It's That's not a statement on John Curl being dumb or anything like that. It's a statement on John Curl really being a, uh, a setup a roadie par excellence mm. and the one of the things about the grateful dead even although the, their musicianship could be mediocre from time to time which of course i forgave um they were technically very sophisticated mm. yeah hmm. yeah and, that. and people think they're a bunch of loaders well yeah they were mm -hmm. um but uh, things were different back in the 60s. You know, there were, uh, I went to a Grateful Dead concert once that uh, uh, there were two things, big uh, containers of lemonade, you know, lemonade, and one was free and one cost a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, great memories, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, God, I can't believe that I'm, uh, that I talked myself out. Yeah, my goodness. Wow. I well, 